What do you think defines sacred space? Is it the beautiful domes of Florence, bringing heaven to earth in pictorial fashion, or the quiet chapels of the outside, the majestic spire pointing to heaven, or the anchorite cell showing solitude? Perhaps it's the domes and spires of Russian orthodoxy, or the occasioned upon Celtic cross along a path, culturally different Ethiopian orthodoxy, the chapel, St. Augustine's Drafton, the play area, the children's sacred space of Holy Trinity. Welcome to the third session of our Advent course on the theme of worship. And today we're going to just explore a little bit about sacred space. Well, I'm standing in Holy Trinity. It's uh, the place that marks out where some of the Christians come in Skipton to worship and to gather in the name of Christ. And I thought I would stand with the open window just behind me, uh, by which I mean it hasn't got any stained glass in other than Lady Anne's signature, um, because it looks outside. It tells of an outdoors, maybe including some of the outside space for those on the inside, the natural world being the stained glass, if you like. But mainly because in most bits of ministry that I've done in the past, many people have come up to me and said, Vicar, Rector, I don't come to church, but I don't think I really need to. I can worship God anywhere. And quite often it might be followed by, I prefer to go up into a quiet space on the, the mountaintop or the fell side, or along the river or in the woods. And that's their place where they feel closest to God. So there's no designated place, perhaps, no building, shall we say. So what does it mean to have a sacred space? What do you mean by it? Why do we need church buildings at all? Surely we could just ring each other up just before every Sunday and say, well, we're going to gather in the field just above Skipton or in the marketplace or down by the canal. We could take our pick because Jesus says where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. So why do we need church buildings? Well, perhaps one of the answers to that question is, uh, comes out of uh, the awful situation that's behind me, the locked door. We're in a COVID pandemic and unfortunately we can't have uh, the church open all the time. That's a great sadness for us. But it tells a story also, that there is a desire in our hearts as the people of Christ to have the doors of our buildings open for those that wish to come and pray and find sanctuary, find peace. So there's something about sacred space which is marking out a place which is accessible to all, that somehow contains within it the story of the journey that we're on. That is a meeting place, if you like. And the reason it's such a sadness that these doors are closed is because this is the meeting place where we know we can find sanctuary, where we know we can light a candle, where we know we can sit and be honoured and we know that others are doing the same thing. So the sacredness comes out of a collective identity. Of course, Anywhere is sacred because it's been created by God. So everything is sacred. And that is a foundational belief of Christianity. We're just about to come up to, Christian, uh, to, to Christmas. And the central theology is the incarnation. That God becomes incarnate of flesh with creation. Well, if that's the case, then he's touched the earth. And that means that everything is sacred. 
The difference between a sacred space being marked out, we might say, is that as a group who acknowledge the wonder and the presence of God, we have agreed that this will somehow be a place which tells the story. This will be a place which we mark out collectively to always be just for the glory of God, even as we might forget. So I might be getting on with other, all, all other sorts of things in my life, but if I've come to Holy Trinity and done morning prayer in the morning and I've left the doors open, my distraction, my movement away from God, doesn't mean that someone's towards God will not be allowed as they walk past the building. The building will be there, irrespective of my distractions. So what marks out what we might call a Christian sacred space? Well, I think it's a mixture of things. At the end of St. Luke's Gospel, the final sentence after we hear the record of Jesus' ascension into heaven is as follows. And the disciples returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. So the disciples, who were all Jewish, will have returned to the house of God, the temple, which was marked out in a particular way and was huge and had all sorts of different structures and systems involved with regard to the worship of God. But mostly it was designed to be open to the people on pilgrimage from the different places in Judea. And one of the reasons Jesus was so upset in the temple was because they seemed to have blocked the way to those who had very little or to foreigners and were stopping them getting in. But the disciples decided that this grand place, the house of God, which the Old Testament tells us is what the Jewish people built in order to house the covenant, to house the place where God would come amongst them. That was where the disciples wanted to be. But then in the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, written by the same author, Luke, we hear that um, on the day of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, that when the day of Pentecost had come, the disciples were all together in one place and suddenly a sound came from heaven like the rush of a mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. So we find the disciples of Christ in a house, in a normal residence, together, not in the temple, and that is where the Holy Spirit came. It was a much more intimate space where they were gathered, probably trying to work out what to do, and possibly already following in the way of Christ and sharing together and sharing the meal, the Last Supper, together. But it was a normal domestic house. And we know from the records that the early Christians used their own houses. However, to think that they just used it any old way is probably a mistake. A lot of the archaeological evidence and some of the history too tells us that they would have used particular parts of the house. They would have tried to set it aside. So it both had the domesticity, the ordinariness, the friendliness of the home. It also had a sense of being set aside. And perhaps they took that from the temple. So there's something about the sacred space of Christianity, which both has a sense of the awe and transcendence of the temple and the more homely idea of gathering around the table. So we'll explore that a little bit with the shape of the church here at Holy Trinity. 
Holy Trinity is a largely linear space. It's designed so that you feel like you're going on a journey. So, for example, you'll walk into the church and the first thing that you come past is the font, which tells you that as a Christian, the first thing that you should be doing is being baptised, christened. Only once you've gone through the River Jordan, if you like, you've crossed from the wilderness into the Promised Land, are you ready to move further on in your journey? So the font is here as a reminder. It doesn't mean we've all got to immediately jump in, but it's a constant reminder that that is the shape of the journey. So the building, the space, its sacredness reflects that. And then on you go and into the nave, this beautiful nave with a certain equality of pews in the past. Uh, probably would have to pay for them, which was certainly not the point of the nave. The nave is an equal space. It's a place where all the people congregate. Before there were pews here, I'm sure there was probably sheep and all sorts of other animals during the uh, weekday as well. It was a public space. It's designed for the people to gather, to tell something about the everyday nature of their life. And of course, in that space is the pulpit and the lectern because that's where you receive the Word of God, that's where you gather together, much like a, a synagogue in uh, the more ancient Jewish sense, and today too, where you'd gather around the Word and the Word would be processed around you and you would learn and interact. A lot of our sermons tend to be one way, don't they? But actually the idea is for us all to gather around the Word and learn together because that's the way the space is designed. And then, once you've heard the word and you've prayed to God, you then meet with the screen. Well, the screen there would originally have probably had a huge cross on the top. It would have certainly had a rude loft. And that loft would have had the minstrels and the musicians in. But the idea would be that once you've heard the word and you've gathered together, you then go through the gate underneath the cross as if you're going through the cross to meet with Christ and there you gather around the table and quite often during in medieval times on the other side of the screen would have been all sorts of hopeful imagery a more uh, upbeat imagery so that when you came back you were walking back with the sense of the hope of the resurrection back through the cross back through the nave out of the door and into the world so the linear space, the sacredness of the space, was to tell you something of the shape of your journey in Christ. And so you would then take that back out into the world and try and put that to practice in the people and the places that you found yourselves with. Another traditional Christian space would be just simply to gather in the round. Perhaps like some of the original um, house churches where they gathered in particular places in the house and they would gather around the table. And if you go into quite a few uh, modern churches, think of Liverpool, the Roman Catholic Cathedral in Liverpool, for example, built in the round so that when you come in, all of the pews, all of the chairs are gathered. And there's a sense of equality about that. But there's also something which the early Christians picked up when they took on some of the basilicas that, uh, or the, the domes that, that the Roman Empire used for their spaces of pagan worship. And that was quite good for the early Christians because they then had this sense of gathering together all in the round and then the dome above them, or that, that space which became a basilica, was like heaven. So it was like heaven on earth, which was the point of Christ. So the basic idea of the sacredness of the building was to show that you were gathered with the community of saints, those who have gone before you, and with the heavenly Christ at the eternal banquet, the heavenly banquet. And that's how you would gather. And quite often if you take on, if you go to uh, the, the Middle East now, you'll see that mosques actually have 
that dome. And that's not actually because they decided that that was what they wanted. It's because they took on the Christian spaces and that's what the Christian spaces had. So there's two different understandings of how we gather within a sacred space. They aren't the only ones. You can find tiny small chapels where there's just a sense of contemplative, meditative, hermit-like um, prayerful space before God. And we get a sense of the early cell of the, um, the hermits that took themselves away in order to offer themselves just to God. So there are lots of different spaces, but they all tell a story. They all tell us something about who we are, what our identity is, whether it's the grandeur, the simplicity, the equality, the idea of the dome of heaven, St Paul's Cathedral, if you like, or maybe St um, Salisbury Cathedral. Think of Salisbury Cathedral, that great spire, pointing up to the heavens in symbolic way, so that it doesn't matter where you are in the countryside, around Salisbury or somewhere like Ely, for example, you can see the cathedral pointing up to something other, something which shapes your life, something more important than just you and the worldliness of your existence. And so the building strikes a symbolism into our everyday life, shapes who we are, tells us something about our identity. And if that's what makes it sacred, then that's something of the Incarnation. That's something of Christ touching our lives. All spaces tell us something about who we are and what we consider to be sacred. Of course, in the Christian tradition, right from the outset, Jesus welcomed the children, he welcomed the women, he welcomed those who were understood to be on the edges and to a certain extent insignificant to be seen and not heard, sometimes not even seen. So the space in a Christian church really ought to demonstrate that it values the sacredness of the child, the infant, the adolescent, because they must be included and it's too easy for us, often because it disturbs the patterns and the regular rhythms of our own prayerful existence to exclude. Well, isn't it good here at Holy Trinity that it's clear that children are valued, that there's space for them, and that we might consider that to be equally sacred? Oh